so this is part of a short series uh, where we're going to talk about things that are flying in some fairly well-defined part of our future, okay? Not too far out. And so uh, two weeks ago, before we had uh, Easter, Passover, and Ramadan, made it through those, okay? Um, um, Anders Carlson talked about um, the prospects for uh, energy storage, storage of various forms of energy in the St. Louis area and how we might do that in the future. Next week, my colleague Mike Novak is going to talk about uh, the future of um, a scientific exploration of the cosmos and in particular, uh, some of the missions and technologies uh, that, that we use today and what's coming up in the future. I'm going to take a more broad look and I'm going to tell you what I see coming in the next 20 years. And by restricting myself to 20 years, what that means is that I don't have to worry about some guy in 2100 inventing anti-gravity or something, which I, I actually don't think is going to happen, but it's hard to rule it out. So this is kind of a, a short look ahead, you know, which is kind of more based on what we see today than anything else. And of course, there's a lot going on today. So we always like to look into the future. We have for a long time. It's certainly part of the Western tradition. This uh, painting, which shows people in air cars, um, you know, leaving the opera, okay, fancy dress. Oddly enough, the opera clothes they're wearing in the year 2000 are the same as they wore in 1902. But in the air cars are very fancy looking things. And you can see that, you know, the artist has imagined, you know, what the technology implementation would look like and how people would get on and off platforms, kind of like getting on and off a cruise ship, right, into, into their cars. And, um, you know, in more modern times, we're really looking ahead. So this says, future birthplace of Captain James T. Kirk, March 22nd, 2228, uh, I think. Um, and this is an actual place, okay, in Iowa, Riverside, Iowa. And, um, you know, people are, are looking ahead to that time. And um, let me just get rid of this guy. Okay, that was wrong. There we go. Okay, so this is in line with the comment of Peter Thiel, probably the thing he's said that I agree with most. Um, he's a venture capitalist, if you don't know who he is. Uh, he is a, a majority owner, I think, of Palantir, which is a stupid organization. Um, he said, we wanted flying cars, instead we got 140 characters. That was the original limit on the number of characters in a tweet. Okay? And it's true. We do not really have flying cars. So what we wanted to get or expected to get and what we actually got instead, well, you know, we, we wanted flying cars. We thought that would be really cool. And I, I grew up with the Jetsons. Maybe some of you did too. There was kind of the Flintstones in the past, and then there was the Jetsons in the future. Daughter Judy, Jane his wife, our boy Elroy, um, Rosie the robot maid, right? And what we got, well, this is a picture of what it looks like to fly today. <laughs> you know, and yes, I'm always the guy in the middle. <laughs> um, you know, when we think about space travel, well, on TV, it looks like this, and it's way cool. And this is the International Space Station. Hasn't come down yet, but, uh, you know, it's, it's not bad. 
you know, so I would give flying about a D, comparing these two, and it's early in space travel, really, still. So I would give this maybe a C or something. It's not, it's not bad, right? Um, on the other hand, you know, we have this vision of ubiquitous nuclear power, unlimited power, safe, clean power. And this is the US Enterprise engine room. You can see the matter antimatter cells in the background there where all the business is done. And what we got was the nuclear ship Savannah, the first and only um, commercial nuclear ship. And it was on the seas for about 12 years and then it was decommissioned as not being economically viable. Well, that's, well, you know, I mean, I don't know if this is something that we really hope to get, but it was sure pretty sophisticated. You know, we wanted Arnold. We wanted the Terminator, you know? But what we got was Amazon Astro, $1,600. Kind of looks like an iPad with a vacuum cleaner. Um, so when I went to look this up on the internet, um, you know, I saw $1,600, that's pretty pricey. And then a few days later, I got an email from Amazon saying, we noticed you were looking at Astro. Are you interested in putting Astro in your car? You know, it just tells you a little bit about modern times. The actual robots that Amazon uses look like this. Um, they're, they're, you know, about this high. And what they actually do is they maneuver themselves under pallets in the warehouse and they move the pallets around. They're, they're, they're pretty specialized little robots, but apparently they work pretty well. So I don't know, I don't know. I, I would have to give the nuclear power kind of an F and maybe, a, maybe the robots sort of a, hmm, what do you think, a C? Maybe. Now, the only place where we really shine, I think, is in communications and computing portable devices here. You know, this is a Star Trek communicator, Star Trek tricorder, and we didn't get those. What we got were an iPhone, an iPad, and an Apple Watch. And if you could read this, um, it says high heart rate. Your heart rate rose above 120 beats per minute while you seem to be inactive. And, you know, check it out, right? And, uh, you know, I, I have uh, a friend who was told by his cardiologist that he had a problem and he needed to get himself an Apple Watch. So, you know, these, this thing doesn't even have a screen for crying out loud. No FaceTime, no Zoom. You know, so this is one area where I'd, I'd have to give us an A, okay? Now, our world as we know it today is based around a lot of fairly recent technologies. By recent, I mean in my lifetime, okay? Um, and these are not just... Okay, they're not like curried coffee machines, you know, sort of a one shot, you put the pot in, you get the cup of coffee, you're done. These are enabling technologies. These are technologies that build on previous work that work together and that make up a coherent technological world, an ecosystem, if you like, that we live in. Okay, um, and it really starts with transistors. Transistors were replacements for the vacuum tubes of old radios and TVs, the first solid state devices. This is a, a model, a recreation really, of the first transistor. It looks kind of like it's put together with spit and bailing wire and stuff. And that's because it was, you know, it's kind of hand soldered, but it worked. And we soon learned how to put the transistors together 
into things we call integrated circuits. And so, you know, where we used to have transistor radios that had real transistors, we now have a single chip and it, it basically does everything. Not that anybody buys transistor radios anymore, but you could, okay? And that was 1947. And in the 50s and 60s, we developed lasers, like the one I'm using, okay? And the cheap adoption of lasers was made possible, of course, by integrated circuits, by solid state physics. And it opened up a whole new world. Surveying became easier. Checking out at the grocery store became easier. If you had a problem with your eye or you needed some other forms of surgery, the doctor would use a laser maybe to treat you, to fix things. Lasers are just everywhere. And it's this wonderful technology that we can use for communication, for uh, manufacturing. You know, and it goes right in here with LEDs, you know, which we use all the time uh, to communicate and to tell us, tell us things. We can do things with LEDs and drones. I mean, whoever dreamed that there would be drone fireworks? Kind of wild. Um, and it's really just uh, a whole new world. But at the same time, there are other things that are sort of more behind the scenes like superconducting magnets. And that really started to be practical in 1962 with the development of niobium titanium magnets, okay? What you do is you, you take a, a niobium titanium thin wire, you braid it together to make a larger wire, and then you use that larger braid to make a magnet which would cool to temperatures uh, that are very low by liquid helium, you get a very, very strong magnet. And if anybody here has ever had an MRI, well, that's made possible by superconducting magnets. Also, you know, in my own field, for example, um, all the part modern particle accelerators use superconducting magnets to uh, accelerate elementary particles to about the speed of light, okay? At the same time, we have permanent magnets, like the one that is holding this guy onto its stand. And these are about twice as strong as magnets used to be. And they're strong because they're made with rare earths, neodymium, um, samarium, um, these are the guys over here. Ah, it's over here. Yep. Okay. These are the guys that are, are down here in the periodic table. Okay. Um, really interesting technologies. And then on the computer side, the technology that's enabled by this stuff at the top, um, one of the most significant developments was the development of supercomputers. In 1966, there was the CDC 6600, maybe the first true commercial supercomputer. CDC was Control Data Corporation. It was a, what's called a vector supercomputer because it was like a conventional computer. It only had one central processor, but it was really fast, okay? Um, that's what it looked like. Uh, when I was at Brookhaven National Laboratory before I came here to Washington University, I used to talk to the CDC 6600 to uh, run computer simulations for my physics research. We actually had a more powerful computer, the CDC 7600 at the lab, but the CDC, 6, CDC 7600 was so powerful that they didn't let mere mortals talk to it. You had to go through an intermediary and bow down before the 6600 and get it to communicate with the 7600. <clears throat> at least the 7600's time, okay? And that 
turned in 1985 into what are called parallel supercomputers, which is what all supercomputers today are. These are supercomputers with multiple CPUs, multiple integrated circuits, multiple brains, if you like. Um, and by doing that, we get much more power than we ever had with the old uh, Cray and CDC supercomputers. And then in 1969, the internet at CERN, another contribution of particle physics to make it easy to shop online at Walmart <laughs> and Amazon. No, no, I mean, you know, it's, it's impossible to, um, you know, under to overestimate the importance of the internet and the World Wide Web. Okay, it really is. It's really changed our world. You know, we just we just accept it. I think, and you don't think back to the time. Now, the interesting thing is that the internet itself came out of ARPANET. Okay, and ARPANET was uh, something funded by the Department of Defense. It was designed to survive nuclear war. It turns out it's capable of also. Um, surviving hacking. It's pretty good. It's been a very reliable thing. And then it was the World Wide Web, of course, that came out of CERN. Now, the thing I want you to notice about all these enabling technologies is that with the exception of the software that makes up the World Wide Web, what era are they all from? 1960s, right? Post-World War II. So it does take a long time for these technologies to, these hardware technologies to get into our normal lives. But what we're seeing today is that the software technologies are adopted faster and faster, okay? So here, before you leave that particular slide, uh, would nano capabilities be considered a technology Sort of on this. I'll, I'll talk a little. I'll talk. I'll talk a little bit about about those kinds of technologies. Okay. Now we are getting to the point where we really have to think about some fundamental limits of our technology. Limits that are placed not by politics. You you see the bumper sticker, the speed of light. It's not just a good idea. It's the law. Right, three times 10 to the eighth meters per second. It's the ultimate limit on how fast we can travel, how fast we can communicate information. And so there is a limit on what we can influence. This is a drawing of the, the light cone and it shows the causal structure of space time. We're here where the two cones meet. The stuff inside the past light cone is the stuff that influences us, and the stuff that's in the future light cone is the stuff that we can influence. The stuff over here, along this plane, say, is the stuff that we can't do anything about, right? We can't, we can't communicate with it. We can only communicate with that area of space in some future time. And this is a real limitation. The speed of light sounds like it's so fast. Three times 10 to the eight meters per second. Wow, you know, that's 300 million meters per second. That's fast. However, it's a little slower in coaxial cable or other conducting materials, maybe two times 10 to the eight meters per second. And that works out to about a, a, a foot per nanosecond. A foot per nanosecond. But how fast are we driving modern electronics? Yeah, we're in the nanosecond range. Okay, we're getting close to it. <laughs> Gigahertz, right? Um, so we have to start worrying about how close things are together, right? Uh, people who do electronic trading worry about how close their computers are to the New York Stock Exchange, because the closer you are, the more of an edge you've got, and edges matter, okay? There are also limitations from quantum physics. 
The Heisenberg uncertainty principle, let me see if I can get this guy to go. There we go. Tells us that particles are not particles in some sense, but they are wave packets. And so they have a finite size, as you see here, there's a little wave packet. And they have a uncertainty in their location because they're spread out a little bit in space. And they also have an uncertainty in their momentum and their energy because they're fluctuating as well. And so the Heisenberg uncertainty principle says that the uncertainty in momentum times the uncertainty X is bounded by a certain quantum number, Planck's constant, h bar over two, h bar is Planck's constant, which is very small, but it's a real limitation on how small we can make things and see them. Related to this is the idea that's illustrated here, which is quantum tunneling. You see there's a barrier and sometimes the particle is mostly on one side, sometimes it's mostly on the other side, sometimes it's kind of split between the two, but the point is that it can actually go through the barrier, which if it were classical particle could do. It doesn't have enough energy to get over the barrier. But <laughs> quantum mechanical particles can do that. What does that have to do with modern electronics? Well, it's a form of crosstalk. If you make things real small in integrated circuits, you can get tunneling between the different components. And it's a real problem, okay? And so there is some ultimate limit probably ahead. It's set by the laws of quantum mechanics. One of the other issues, how many people have ever had a computer overheat on them? Yeah, okay, no fun. Okay, so computers require energy to work. And that energy produces heat, computing, thinking. Anybody said, my brain is overheating? Ah, yeah, that happens, right? <laughs> um, so are there limits here? Yeah, they are, there are. There is an ultimate limit, probably. I, I say that because it's a complicated issue that has to do with thermodynamics. So this is something that I, I taught my students this year in our graduate statistical mechanics class. If you look at the uh, energy, the entropy required to flip a single bit, okay, in an irreversible way, I'll say for the experts like Joe, um, then you pick up a, a little bit of the entropy there. You've lost information. You know, if you, if you like, so suppose you had a, a disk and you wipe the disk and make it random, okay? That's gonna generate entropy, randomness. And it takes energy to do that. And the amount of energy depends on the temperature and then it's Boltzmann's constant times the temperature times the log of two. And this is called the Landauer limit. And it's the minimum energy required to flip a bit, okay? Now this right today is a theoretical limit, but if you're doing quantum computing, it can be a real issue, okay? Because quantum computing is done at very low temperatures. And so this is something that we now have to think about. Modern computers at room temperature, they just generate a lot of heat and the designers have to deal with it. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Now there are other fundamental laws of physics that we have to deal with. We have to deal with the conservation of energy. We have to have the energy to do what we want. And we also have to have the materials that, to do what we want. And today, more than ever, we're dependent on a lot of unusual materials. Like for example, helium-4. There's a certain percentage of helium-4 in the atmosphere, but there's not that much helium-3. And sometimes we need helium-3, they're isotopes of each other, and helium-3 is the rare one. We, we're using a lot of lithium now because we use lithium ion batteries. We're using rare earths for things like permanent magnets and for other applications, and to make unusual materials. 
And of course, we're still using radioactive materials for all kinds of things. For commercial testing, radioactive materials are often used to uh, do uh, in situ uh, checks of construction. You know, it can, it's one of the few things that can emit radiation that will get through metal, right? And of course, it's also used in radiation therapy. Now, sometimes you think, well, e equals mc squared, so they're really not conserved separately. They're, it's really just energy and momentum together. They're equivalent. But in fact, it's really hard. It's hard to take you know, power off of Ameren's electrical grid and turn it into like a television. You know, Yes, they're equivalent, but no, it doesn't work that way. We can't even turn it into gold. Okay, unless you mine Bitcoin, which is a whole different subject. Okay, so for all practical purposes, it's energy conserved and matter conserved, and we don't worry about the interconversion. Even with nuclear power, we are not actually turning matter into energy. What we're doing is we're releasing the binding energy of the nuclei that bind them together inside the atom. Okay, so we're just using a fraction of the total amount of energy available in the nucleus. Okay, if you're in Star Trek, they do matter to antimatter collision, total conversion, excellent. But we only get a very, very tiny fraction of that power in nuclear reactors or in nuclear explosions. So we, we, we've got these limitations, but within these limitations, we're free to do a lot of interesting and different things. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about future enabling technologies and where we might be headed. Now, remember that the lead time for technology can be very long. And remember that a lot of the technology that is so influential on in our lives today is stuff that was invented in the 60s. So it's going to look a lot like things you read in the paper today, except extrapolated just a little bit, okay? And we'll see maybe what's gonna happen. Now, computers. I think there's not much question that this is the technology that has changed our lives. You know, we were driving here this morning and on my phone was linked up via Bluetooth to my car. Does give us a map to the university if we wanted. We were listening to a podcast. Um, you know, you know all this this impressive technology we have available. Um, and the rise of this technology has been mostly due to something called Moore's law not really the law itself, but the fact that our technology is obeying Moore's law. So Gordon Moore, who recently passed away, was a founder of Intel. You may have seen his obituary. And he observed in 1966, 65, I guess, that the number of transistors that is an integrated circuit was doubling every two years. In other words, you know, you start off with one transistor, you put two of them together, four, eight, 16, it's real big, real fast. And this is the curve. These are all individual devices, hard to read. It's actually hard to read on, on the original, uh, which you can find on Wikipedia. But, you know, it just shows, this is a, a, a log axis. So it's actually zooming up very, very fast. This is the log of the number of transistors as a function of year. And one of the things that's made that possible is our increased ability to make very small things, okay? Nanotechnology. So this is a plot of the size of our devices. You know, we started at about uh, three microns. That is, a mil three microns is three millionths of a meter, okay?
Okay. And we are now down here at three nanometers. That's a factor of a thousand smaller in scale. Okay. Now we're at the scale at which we really do have to worry about quantum effects in the geometry. Some designs just aren't going to aren't, aren't going to work, you know. But we have this unprecedented ability to do things at scales which are very, very small. And so even though modern chips, I don't know if you've looked at modern uh, integrated circuits, the CPUs, the central processing unit, the brain of the computer, uh, they're, they're pretty big, not that big, and they get pretty hot, right? And, you know, so the thing that is really saving us in some sense is the fact that we're, we're packing more transistors in, okay? And this is um, really important, okay? Now, there, there's physics here. You know, we're ultimately probably limited by quantum mechanics as to how small we can go. And we're probably limited a little bit by how large we can go too and get productive yields in our, our, CP, in our uh, integrated circuit manufacturer. Now, that I gotta mention this just because it's so much fun. Um, there's also a bound on data storage. It's a theoretical limit. Do not worry about this happening to your like hard disk. It's called the Bekenstein bound. Now, Bekenstein, Jacob Bekenstein was a general relativist. It's a bound that comes from black hole physics. If you try to put too much storage into too small a region, you run into the Bekenstein bound, okay? So it's actually, it's, it was actually derived from black hole physics. It doesn't actually have to be derived that way. It's a more fundamental bound and it doesn't really involve gravity, okay? But it's, it's there. We're not close. Don't, do not worry about that one. You put a minimum size on your black hole? What? That put a minimum size on your black hole? Um, there, it's, it's actually, it's really interesting. It's, it's a bound on the mass times the radius. Yeah, so it's not a bad, uh, just a bound on density. You might think there would be some bound on density or some, but it's, 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 it's subtle the way it comes out. Yeah, it's very interesting. Now, how does this sort of thing play out in um, our world? Well, this is, I think, arguably the most powerful uh, chip in consumer electronics today. It's the Apple M2 chip. Probably pretty within the next year, there'll be an M3. Okay. And this is the chip that's found in, you walk into the Apple store and you give them not inconsiderable amount of money. And you get a MacBook Pro or a MacBook Air or a Mac Mini or an iPad Pro, okay? This is a really powerful chip, okay? Now, one of the things that's interesting about this is that the components that go into it are the technology, as it were, is licensed from ARM, which is a European country, English, actually, um, but it's actually designed by Apple. In other words, they're not using ARM's designs. They're using ARM's fundamental architecture, but it's their own design that Apple provides, and it's better than ARM's designs. They don't actually manufacture it. It's actually manufactured by TSMC. That's the Taiwanese, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company. And they are the best in the world at doing this kind of stuff. Um, this chip is made with a five nanometer process, which is just sort of a indication of the scale. It's not, there's not, it's not that everything is five nanometers. It's actually mostly larger than that, but it's just sort of a general indication of how small the, the spacing is on, on these kinds of chips. Um, and probably, you know, they'll, uh, TSMC is able to do three nanometers. 
years now. And, you know, probably that'll become the standard for high performance stuff pretty soon. Okay. Now, this is an interesting chip because it has this thing labeled CPU. Um, it's actually eight CPUs. Four of them are high power chips, which can go very fast. Four of them are low power that go a little bit slower, but use a lot less energy. So if you're just sitting there surfing the web, you're using the low power CPUs. And if you're like, I don't know, running a simulation, I actually used this on uh, yesterday in my statistical mechanics class to show the kids in the class computer simulations. I can do them in real time on this. And this isn't even powered by uh, an M1 chip. It's a, the older A11 chip, okay? Um, in addition to the CPUs, it's got things called graphical processing units. Um, they're called GPUs, graphical processing units, because they're very good at the kind of math that you need to do to do graphics, rotating objects. Rotating objects turns out to be matrix multiplications, and that's what GPUs are really good at, linear algebra. That means they're also good for scientific and engineering applications, okay? So in our department, we have machines that are made up of a few CPUs and a lot of GPUs. And it's one way of building a supercomputer. And most of these GPUs, the best ones, are made by one company, NVIDIA, OK? Which I think I saw occupy somewhere around if you look at the total weighting of the S&P 500, NVIDIA is about 5%. So, you know, one of the things that's interesting about today is that we are highly dependent on technology that's owned or developed or the best are people like TSMC in Taiwan, which I remind you is sort of real close to a larger place where they speak similar languages. Um, and, you know, NVIDIA is an American company, uh, but still, you know, we've only got one really great source for, for GPU technology. I, I believe the Apple thing is, the Apple uh, chip is its own, their own design. It's also got a neural engine, which is used for AI applications. And I'll, I'll come back to that, okay? Now, this chip is capable of almost four teraflops of performance per second. That is, until very recently, supercomputer level performance, like big computer, worship the computer, you know? This is amazing technology to have, you know, in a tablet or in a MacBook Air. I mean, the original CDC 6600, we were talking megaflops. The Cray 1, you know, getting to the gigaflops. That's giga is billion floating point operations per second. Terra is trillion floating point operations per second. These things are incredible. And the M2 chip is about twice as fast as an Intel i9, their top of the line, but it uses half the power. And so you can get about up to 20 hours on your laptop for one of these. And this is something that is only going to improve. But again, if you want this kind of performance, you gotta go to the Apple store, you go to the um, Microsoft store, you're gonna get something that is, is not quite this good. And you know, um, our Congress passed a law that is subsidizing the development of ch chip technology and chip uh, uh, manufacturing in the, in the US. Which companies are it going to? Is this gonna work out for us? What's the future look like here? These are really crucial technologies, but it's kind of an awkward government industry partnership where government wants a robust competitive industry based in the United States, but manufacturing and design capabilities vary and some of the, the best people are not necessarily here in our country or even these days in countries that are 
friendly to the United States. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that go into this. And I expect these kinds of technology international relations issues are going to be increasingly important in the next couple of decades. Now, there's uh, more technology uh, that we need to think about. Um, so but I, I assume that most of you have access to the internet, maybe through an ISP, right? So how many people have AT&T Universe? No shame, no shame. How about uh, Charter? Okay, well, Charter turns out to be a little bit faster than Uverse, sometimes by a lot, according to the data I've seen. But in fact, it's not very good, okay? I mean, everybody hates their, their cable TV provider. Everybody hates their internet provider. But let me tell you something. We spent the fall on sabbatical in Seattle, home of Microsoft, Amazon, lots of high tech. It's all fiber there. Whereas in St. Louis, we're mostly copper cable. There it's optical fiber, this stuff, the stuff of kids' toys. Oh, okay, not quite this stuff. That's 15 bucks at Amazon. Um, but optical fiber gives you tremendous improvement in speeds. So you can get one to two gigabytes per second from fiber, where you get 25 megabits per second with AT&T universe. Okay. So, you know, stuff that <laughs> would take, you know, minutes to download in St. Louis takes no time at all in places like Denver or Seattle or Austin, okay? So we are actually doing a lousy job here in the United States. Almost all European countries have cheaper, faster internet than we do. It's kind of a national disgrace, honestly. I mean, sure, <laughs> working on bringing better internet access to rural communities, and I think that's important for sure. But the fact that we have this monopoly and duopoly situation where crucial enabling technologies are handed off to a bunch of companies that are just content to sit on their, <clears throat> sit where they sit, um, it's just a national disgrace. It's terrible. Do you think they have to do more with the density though? I mean, the density of cities in Europe is like, heck of a lot higher, more like it is on the East Coast here. Yeah, but you can't, more spread you, out. You, you, can't, you can't tell me that Seattle and Austin are that different from St. Louis. Um, true, true. So you're saying, let's fall behind Kansas City. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so, so Google I, came I, in and I, 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 I'm on a committee which gets to see what the university is doing in terms of giving researchers here high-speed access. And, and let me tell you, it's a lot of it's a lot more work than you think. I can also tell you that um, students use a lot of bandwidth on the internet, but it's There's mostly a, it's mostly to stream YouTube and <laughs> yeah. We have a, we have a, we have separate channels just for the students. <laughs> um, anyway, so uh, another thing that's that's coming, and and honestly, I don't know how this one is going to turn out. Okay. Um, it's called the Internet of Things, and um, it's the idea that all those smart devices in your home, you know, Alexa, Siri, hey, Google, all those guys, not just those guys, but your washing machine, your refrigerator, your Instapot, wouldn't you like them connected to the Internet? The answer is maybe. Or maybe not. <laughs> so, you know, there are technologies available today where you can have cameras inside your refrigerator. And if you're not sure if you need milk, you can log on to your refrigerator from the grocery store and take a look around. Is this something you want? I, I don't know. Do you want to be able to unlock the house when your kid forgets their key? without having to go back to your house for work. 
Well, that you may want to do. <clears throat> but there are all kinds of issues of things like security and accessibility that we have to face. Now, there's a standard that is just getting started. It's promoted by Apple, Amazon, Google, and other large companies to promote a standard that will provide supposedly a platform that will be secure and easy to use and interoperable. You won't have to choose between Siri or Alexa. You can go back and forth between them. You can date both, right? Uh, will this work? I have no idea. Do people really want this? I, I have to say this. Uh, I saw this on Colbert. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure it's true, but a toilet that monitors your bowel movements and tells you, oh, you should be eating more, you know. More <laughs> fiber? I don't want that. Yeah, yeah. Want Sorry. yeah I, I've so far turned down the opportunity to get a internet connected scale. There's <laughs> a, there are things that I just want to keep between me and the scale, you know? Um, yeah. Is one of the alternatives to a standard, an industry proposed standard, is one of the alternatives? Leaving it to the state legislatures to come up with their approach to the be better. I, I would not, frankly, frankly, I have felt for decades that the Missouri legislature is worth about what we pay them. And we don't pay them very much. They're overpaid. And that, that was that was before the current, how shall I say it? fun era of politics that we're seeing as state legislatures develop opinions about everything, including relations with foreign countries and uh, things that I think are best left private between you and your bathroom equipment. So is the alternative to not the legislatures and not the industry standard? <laughs> is, are we left with simply out to the free market? No, I, I think I, th I think here the interesting thing about it, honestly, is um, that you know we did have sort of the wild wild west situation where the technology for all these you know uh, lights and things. There's the Zigbee standard, for example, which is not a standard, but a lot of people use it uh, to control things. Hmm. And then the, the the big guns, you know, the Apples, Amazons, and Googles, and so, et cetera, said, hey, we need to have something that works if we're going to sell a lot of this stuff. And they said, we're going to come up with a standard. But the point is, really, do people want this? Is this something that's going to make our lives that much better? And that's the thing I don't know. I, I, would, not, I, I would not think that the federal government could do a better job of this sort of thing than the industry itself. Because Congress and federal rulemaking uh, organizations are, are a little slow compared to the pace of technology. Yes. I think one, one area where the answer is, do we want this, is pretty clearly a positive answer, is in the Internet of Things as it features automotive. Um, yeah, that's interesting. So. So, for example, um, General Motors has announced that all of their pure EV vehicles will not have Apple CarPlay or um, what is it, Google Drive? It's not Google Drive, Google something. Yeah. Um, but will have their own proprietary system. And there's a real question as to whether people really actually want that. <laughs> I'm referring more to all the, uh, all the monitoring uh, features that are mileage and oil, oil quality and just all the various uh, diagnostics that are built in uh, to, the, to the automobiles. Today. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, that's kind of a, that, that's an issue today. And, you know, there's all, a lot even, of... Even in terms of combustion engine automobiles are loaded with chips. Yeah. The kind of use yeah, the want, now, though, it's called PAN. One of the questions I have is, you know, how long are these marvelous safety devices? And, and I appreciate them. You know, how long are they going to last? What's going to be their lifetime in the environment of a car? Hmm. You don't really know that. But okay, got to move on. I started late and I apologize, but I got to move on. And I, I apologize to all you folks uh, out there, um, you know, because 
Uh, I was a little clumsy with the technology this morning. I was off my game. Um, so I'm going to shift gears a little bit and talk about one of the most important future enabling technologies, which is the fact that we, we need to have energy, right? Right, when, where does it come from? Well, this is the best source, generally speaking, for information about US energy usage. It's an independent part of the Department of Energy called the Energy Information Administration. They have a website, of course, and this graph came from it. You can find a lot of information there. And what it shows you is the changing energy budget we have, where our energy comes from. There are also graphs that show where it goes to. Mm -hmm. But the interesting thing about here is that you see this level behavior in coal, the dark blue here, and then it's plunging, and you see the expansion in the use of natural gas. Um, you see that petroleum is maybe decreasing a little bit, but not too much. You see that nuclear is maybe decreasing a little bit and renewables on the whole, the trend is, is up, but it, both nuclear and renewables are a small fraction of our total uh, produced energy, okay? The main thing that is notable over the last, say, 20 years, is the rise in the use of natural gas to replace coal. Now, sometimes politicians will tell you that um, there's a war on coal waged by one political party, but frankly, that ain't so. The thing that's driving the replacement of coal with um, natural gas is simply the fact that it's cheaper to obtain, it's cheaper to build gas-fired turbines than it is coal plants by a lot, and it's a scalable modular technology where if you need to add one more turbine in a year or two to keep up with demand, you can do it. It's just a better technology for most of our energy companies, okay, to produce stationary power. That's what's driving it. It's not some vendetta against Loretta Lynch and West Virginia, okay? It's just economics. And it would happen no matter what the federal government and the state government did. You know, it's just, it's just the reality of things. It happens that natural gas is a little bit better than coal for the environment. Still not great in terms of climate change, but it is, it is cleaner and it is a little bit better for the climate. What's gonna happen? Well, I think we're gonna continue to see this rise of solar wind and hydro. When we drove out to Seattle from St. Louis, we did it 10 years ago. We were on sabbatical about 10 years ago. And we, we started to see some uh, wind turbines and some solar power panels out there through the, the Northwest. And we saw more this time, okay? There's more, it's clear, okay? And we're gonna see even more in the coming times. We're gonna probably see some hydro. The US is, mm, we, we're maxed out on the obvious sources of hydropower pretty much, but there are other countries that can uh, make good use of hydropower. Nuclear power, well, we have a problem. And the, the, the source of the problem is political. It's not, it's not physics. I mean, frankly, I have safety concerns, just as I, I wouldn't want Amarin, you know, necessarily running uh, my doctor's practice you know, and I wouldn't want the state legislature running Ameren. <laughs> um, you know, uh, nuclear power is something that you want in the hands of people who know what they're doing, 
okay? And I have to say that the people, for one reason or another, do not have much faith in nuclear power. So they're completely willing to have it somewhere else, just not close to them. It turns out pretty much all of us feel this way. Nuclear power is expensive, and people don't really want it. And I'm not sure if, if we're going to do this. Now, there is this fusion long shot. And I know that their fusion power, which is completely different from nuclear reactor fission power, has its enthusiasm, enthusiasts. But it's kind of a long shot. Recent progress aside, we're still a very, very <laughs> long way from getting fusion to work at a technical level, much less at a, a practical level, okay? We're having to have trouble scaling it up technically and then getting it to work commercially. It seems very difficult. And frankly, it's not that clean. I think we need to continue research in fusion, and I think we will, but it's probably gonna be our backup to our backup, okay? Don't hold your breath. That's my prediction, okay? Now, there's another aspect of power, and it plays into our love of consumer electronics. You know, most people have some form of portable electronics that they like, okay? Used to be Walkmans. That was cool, <laughs> cool technology. Um, but you have to have power to, to make these things work. Lithium ion batteries, okay? Now, batteries involve trade-offs between the power, the weight, and the cost. You can have a lot of power if you've got a big battery, but it's gonna weigh a lot, and it's gonna cost a lot. You can have a very light battery that provides a, quite a bit of power, but it's gonna cost a lot. Or you can have cheap power, but you don't get very much of it, and, but it doesn't weigh a lot, and it doesn't cost a lot. So little, little, little lithium ion coin cells, for example. So that's something that's going to be increasingly important. For example, this, this week I saw a report about uh, uh, China developing uh, an alternative to lithium batteries, which are sodium-based batteries. Okay, so if you look, uh, let's see. <coughs> Where are you going? 11. Yeah, it's I'm kind of at an angle, so it's gonna, Okay, lithium's right here, sodium is right here. Okay, they have similar chemical properties. There's a heck of a lot more sodium than there is lithium. Okay, and will it work commercially? Well, it's certainly worth exploring. Are the Chinese ahead of us? If I look at these reports, I think maybe they are, you know? Um, now, I know I'm going way over, and I apologize, but just, just to give you a, a flavor of things, um, what's coming that's really new? Well, those of you who are regulars know that one of the things that's coming is quantum computers. These are things that, within certain domains, are going to provide unprecedented computing power. And one of the things it's going to do is it's going to break all <laughs> traditional computers. Um, encryption schemes. All those passwords, oh, they're going to be worthless. Probably the, maybe the NSA can break them now, but they're sure going to be able to break them with quantum computers for sure. On the other hand, it adds a new possibility for a, a new kind of encryption, quantum encryption, which is much more secure. It eliminates a lot of possible attacks based on the interception of information. Because with quantum information transmission, you can know if somebody's listening. It's very clever. So in addition to quantum computing, we've got the quantum internet. Um, and we don't know how we're going to do that. We're looking at a variety of different technologies. Uh, this picture here is a picture of one of my colleagues, Cater Merch with a dilution refrigerator, and it's, um, it's downstairs and about three doors over, okay? And a dilution refrigerator makes things ultra cold for doing quantum information processing. That's what Cater works on. This is a picture of uh, IBM's Q-System 1, 
It's a 20 superconducting qubits. That's like 20 bits, just but they're quantum bits. Very expensive. If you're IBM, you can put it in a really pretty container and hide all the cryogenics. It's actually still there. They've just hidden it. And this is a really powerful quantum computer by today's standards. Okay. In addition to quantum com communication and quantum computing, there's also quantum sensing. And this is sort of an underdeveloped area, and it's one that Washington University is specializing in. It's the idea that you can use quantum sensors that use quantum mechanics to sense things that are very small or very fast, okay? And in some sense, I think in terms of so social impact, we're gonna see this stuff because it's so evident, but you're also gonna see slowly roll out of these quantum sensing. And it's gonna show up for people like me and for Joe who work in technical fields first, and then it's gonna slowly pervade our consciousness as we're able to roll out these technologies. So that's coming. Another thing that is coming is, it's been coming for a long time as designer materials. Here, I just noticed that we, you know, in the past couple of weeks that we had talks, atomic engineering, tailoring atoms and solids at room temperature. And this is a, this shows how you can manipulate individual atoms in a scanning tunneling microscope. You know, you're playing with them like one of those old child's games. You start with sort of a random pattern and you make big circles, you know? And now there are technologies that we're playing with that you can do that at, at room temperature. So we're going to see a lot more of designed things, not things that we make, but things that are designed the way you would design fabric, okay? And we're also going to see a lot of things that are dependent on big data, you know, healthcare that's driven by big data, drug design that's driven by big data, designer materials in which people look at an enormous space of possible compounds and say, oh, these are the new superconductors that we've been looking for. You know, in fact, this talk, which was also given in our department of not that long ago, uh, the speaker talked about new classes of superconductors that are made with uh, manganese boride. And uh, also, you know, there are other ones that are made, for example, with iron. They're still fairly recent. So, you know, one of the issues, though, with big data is not the science. You know, nobody's worried about, the, you know, the secrecy of the atomic table or you know, um, the use of it, big data to design drugs. We're worried about our own personal information. And so the issue here is cost, security, and privacy. It may be socially beneficial, for example, for us to share all of our medical records with the pharmaceutical companies. The pharmaceutical companies think this is a very good idea. Um, me, you, maybe we don't feel that way. So there are a lot of interesting social issues that are gonna play out. I could say more about it. Now, um, I just wanna say a little bit about one more thing that's been in the news a lot, artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence has been around for a long, long time, but with the rise of chat GPT, it's been in the news a lot. Okay, um, these new technologies that are available from uh, Microsoft Bing now incorporates it. You can uh, sign up to get into their program where your Bing search engine, you will use their AI. Um, they're all what are called large language models. Um, how many of you remember diagramming sentences? It's in, you know, like middle school, high school, right? Yeah. I, I'm not sure how much it's taught now, but you know, you 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 have the, the the subject, you know, the verb, you know, the direct object, you know. So grammar has rules. Okay. And how many of you remember playing Mad Libs? That's still around. Okay, Mad Libs, you fill out a form, it's kind of a kid's parents' game. It's kind of fun. 
you know, and you say, give me a verb, give me a noun, and then you, you plug it in, right? So a large language model is like a combination of diagramming sentences and Mad Libs. You've got a structure that's provided for you by the program, and you've got a little bit of randomness where you say, do I use this word or that word? What's a synonym for large, big? Okay, great, you know? And so if you do this and you do it well, these models have about a billion parameters, okay? So there's a lot of, that goes into them. Um, so what I'm showing you over here on the right, and it's, it's pretty technical, it actually has to do with that log two stuff I showed you before, the entropy of information. It's, it's a problem from this graduate class in StatMech um, involving the connection between chaos and entropy. And one of my students plugged this problem set into chat GPT and you, you can read it and it, it reads just like technical prose and it's, it's right. This actually shocked me <laughs> um, because this was the hardest problem on the problem set. The ones that were easier, it completely it didn't do very well. But the hardest problem, maybe it's because it involves computing. It, it knows what it knows, <laughs> but it did pretty well. And overall, I would say on the problem set of a whole, it's somewhere around BB minus performance, but it's gonna get better. So this involves a lot of issues for the disruption of white collar jobs, uh, cheating in higher education. Um, these models tend to have a little problem with hallucination. First, they, they tend to, it, you, in order to train them, you have to throw a lot of information in. If you throw in the New York Times, you may get different behavior than if you throw in a lot of Fox News. <laughs> hope this does not surprise you all. Okay. So every and every once in a while they just lie. They just they just they say I don't know the answer. What am I going to do? He wants he's waiting for the answer. I'm going to tell him something. Are we talking Fox News or Jack? <laughs> <laughs> well, I miss, I'm sorry. I missed. <laughs> I'm willing to use politics a little bit, but I'm not going to go into the details of it. It's just it's it's too painful. But you know, you're sitting there and it, it may just decide, well, you know, I, I don't know much about what you're talking about, but maybe I'll just make something up. Yes, arsenic is safe to use, you know, no, you know. So you, you, there are a lot of safety concerns about using chat GPT in critical areas. And in fact, one of the things I think we're gonna see is we're gonna see expert systems that are sort of made in clean rooms, no Fox, no New York Times, just math just biochemistry, you know? And we're gonna train them to do specific things. And in fact, I can tell you that that's already here. I've seen, I've seen several math uh, companies, including Wolfram, which makes Mathematica, who are designing interfaces where AI is gonna be connected to their math engines. And it happens a lot in the financial industry to give you the answer, buy or sell, but then, Oh, okay. So, so I, I can't answer that. That's a conflict of interest. My son works for a hedge fund. He's a mathematician. I buy. He, he says. He says. He says buy 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 index funds. That's what he says. <laughs> okay. Let me wind this up because you all have been really patient. I'm going to stop with one more thing. Virtual augmented reality. I don't know what's going to happen here. Um, Meta, the parent company of. Um, uh, there's this, there's this uh, online service, I don't know if you've ever heard of it, Facebook. <laughs> okay, they're all in on uh, artificial reality. Um, there's a report that Apple has a device, this is a guess as to what it might look like. You know, there were Google goggles, this is, I don't know, Apple iFrames or something, I don't know what they'll be called. But anyway, we don't know if they're going to come soon or even the fact that they're ever going to be released. But all of this technology suffers from problems because there's processing power issues, there's the cost issue. This is reported to be about a $3,000 item. Uh, battery life is an issue. And then of course there's consumer demand. 
I mean, it's one thing to play Pokemon Go, which is a kind of augmented reality game, but it's another thing to commit $3,000 to something where, for example, um, this is Mark Zuckerberg and he's showing that their metaverse now enables avatars to have legs. Before this point this year, the, they didn't have legs. You know, it's, it looks like a cartoon. Do you really want to pay money for this except to play computer games? It's, it's a little bit of a solution in search of a problem, I think. But I could be wrong. We're definitely going to find out in the next 10 years of that. Now, I could say more about wise public policy, but you, you've all been very patient. Um, so I'm going to stop here. I'm way over time. Um, so I'm going to stop here and ask if you have any questions. Sir. So black matter and black energy haven't been solved. You think your 30 years will be able to solve what black energy is? Uh, yeah, yeah, we usually call it dark, dark, dark matter and dark energy. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know. Um, and the reason why I don't know is that there, well, there are two things. One is that it is dependent on new discoveries that have not been made yet. And the second thing, the discovery, the things we look for are dependent on new ideas about theoretical physics that we don't know are right and are almost certainly wrong because um, some of my colleagues can come up with a new theory every week. And while there aren't that many particle theorists in the world, there are only about maybe, ooh, 5,000 of us. You know, if you work really hard, you can come up with a lot of theories. So, so we don't know. Will this have an impact on our day-to-day -day lives? I think not. It may have an effect on future science and future support for science. We are in a very interesting position. I'm going to loop back to those new technologies of the 60s. All of those technologies came about because there was a world war. Physics helped end the war, not just nuclear weapons, but technologies like radar were incredibly important. And after the war, there were lots of people working on bringing those technologies into helping mankind rather than ending the war, okay? And so do we have the same kind of spirit today that is willing to look decades ahead and say, we don't know what this is going to do, but we're going to do it because we have faith that the new technologies and the new knowledge that we have are going to help us in the future. Frankly, scientific research, a lot of it has gotten very expensive, okay? It's a, it's a visible part. It's something that a congressman can look at and say, oh, that's a billion dollars. That's $10 billion. Um, you know, it's, it's NIH. Let's give it to them. Oh, it's the National Science Foundation. Let's, let's not. <clears throat> it's on this kind of research I like. Yes, kind of research I don't like. No. And so it's, it's dicey. It's, it's, I'm not sure we're at a turning point, but it is completely possible in my mind that we will, there are scientific issues that we face today, like dark matter and dark energy, that we may never know the answer to. Because through some combination of um, lack of will and lack of, of, of money to investigate, combined with lack of new ideas, everybody's going to work for hedge fund companies, not, you know, well, okay, <clears throat> got choices to make. You know, there, there are things that just, we just won't know, you know? Will we make it to Mars, you ask me? <laughs> I don't know. So the telescope is 
faced away from the sun and it works at almost absolute zero? Is that because there's more nanotechnology or quantum uh, computing that can be done from a, a very cold instrument in space that's angled away from the sun? Is the computing a lot better at running it at that yeah, area? That, that, that's a good. That's a good question, and I I, I don't know the I, I don't know the, the the exact answer of the question. In in general. You know, guys like um, my colleagues on the second floor here in, in Compton, the next building over, the, the high energy astrophysics group, sure. in general, they're always looking at new technologies and they're always making design choices. So to give you an idea of how far ahead they're looking, okay, um, they're looking 10 to 20 years ahead for new projects, okay? They have funding now for stuff that if it's, if it's a space-born project, it's 20 years or more. If it's a balloon-born instrument or something you know, domestic, it might be 10 or 15. They might make a decision today on where they think the technology is going to be. Um, and they might guess wrong, okay? Um, but you, know, you always want to have a technology that you think will do the job and be robust enough when you go, you know, when the system is a go, that it that will work, right? And sometimes you make a decision like halfway through development that we're going to switch to a new technology because it's just so obviously better. Um, the sensors on some of these telescopes are good examples of quantum sensors. They are sensitive to in some cases, single particles, okay? They can detect that. But they're not necessarily, they're, they're detecting high energy particles typically, the ones that detect single particles. <laughs> and what we want here on Earth with quantum sensors is we think we want stuff that can, you know, a clinician can hold up against your arm and say, oh, the chemistry that's going on in your spleen or your bladder or wherever is this, right? We want very sensitive pro quantum probes, but we want them to be low energy because frankly, the environment in our bodies is not the same as the environment that <coughs> space telescopes live. <coughs> so, you know, there, there's all kinds of des subtle design trade-offs here. And so, you know, not everything is going to solve every problem. But where we're looking for is a, a wider range of quantum sensors, some of which will require very low refrigeration and some of which won't. What exactly we're going to end up with is not clear. Will we end up with the mythical high temperature superconductor that is commercially viable? We, we don't know. We're still looking. <clears throat> it's that kind of uncertainty. So, you know, we have these, these frameworks where we want technological solutions and we're looking very widely. <clears throat> but you know, it may be that samarium is going to be the most important compound on Earth because it's good for something besides permits and magnets. But we, we don't know today what that will be. Right now, Lithium is pretty important, for example. Will it be in the future? Don't know. Anybody else? Yes, I have a question. Uh, yeah. Could you back up a couple of slides to show the derivation of energy utilization? <coughs> with time? That one, you just, that yeah. one. So one of the things I don't understand about this, and when Anders uh, gave his talk, I think he showed a very similar kind of picture. If we just take petroleum as an example, why is there a spread of about 40 uh, quadrillion British thermal units from low to high? What does that mean? What is it actually measuring? And is that- oh, this, this, is, sorry, this, is a, this, is a, this is a graph where the, the, the data is, is piled on, okay? So, you know, if you if you start with coal, so the total U.S. energy production is around a hundred qu 
quads. That's quadrillion British thermal units. And we've been hovering around 100 quads for a long time, okay? But it varies from year to year. Within that, the percentage of coal is, <coughs> you know, get the total percentage of coal, you have to divide the width of this band by the total, which in 1950 was just over 30 quads. Mm -hmm. But if the width of the band from low to high is from in uh, uh, 2020, <coughs> about uh, 80 quads. So you'd have to divide that to get the percentages. So what this tells you is low to high tells you the relative importance of each band. So the wider the band at any given time, the more energy uh, is, is being produced by that, that technology. I see. Yeah. So you, another way to show this would be to show a pie chart, but this kind of graph shows it as a function of time. And you can, you know, you can see things like the rise of coal, or sorry, the fall of coal and the rise of renewables. And you can see the fluctuations in our energy usage. The really great thing about our economy, and it's a sign of how tech we how high tech we've become, is that our technology is not energy intensive. In the 50s, when we were more dependent on manufacturing, you could see this exponential <laughs> rise. But something happened about 1970. And the rate of growth of energy usage is much less. And now we're fluctuating, but relatively flat. This shows that the energy intensivity of the US economy, as opposed to some developing economies, is staying the same. We're getting a better standard of living for the same amount of energy, which is just showing what new technologies are doing for us, right? We're, we're not as manufacturing based, right? We don't have as much manufacturing. It's, it's, it, it, it is true. It's, it's also dependent on that, on outsourcing and offshoring of manufacturing processes. So one of the things that's interesting is that um, as manufacturing is coming back to the United States, whether that's going to boost the energy intensivity uh, of our economy. I suspect that because our manufacturing has withered so much, there'll be a lot of investment in completely new technologies. And the new technologies are generally less energy intensive than the old ones. And I suspect that although the, the overall energy consumption may go up, I suspect it will not be as steep as it was in this region. I do not expect to see steep growth. But yeah, that's a really interesting question. And that's something that we're gonna, we're not gonna know. It's, you can see the fluctuations in these curves. You don't know it year to year. Yeah, you know, congressmen that. like to ask about, well, what about 2019 compared to 2020? And the time scale here is, is really, you know, five, 10, 20 years. You know, so it's gonna be two decades before we actually know what's gonna happen. Anyway, okay, um, I've kept you all way too long. I apologize. You know, this is just too much fun for me to talk about. I hope it was fun for you. But uh, thank you. And I'll remind you what that's the time is. Next lecture of the week. And then we'll have more lectures in the fall. Um, I hope that next, I haven't looked ahead in, in the calendar, but I hope next spring in particular, we will be divided by religious holidays and we'll be able to do like three or four lectures in a row, which would be nice. Really like to do it that way. Right.